You are listening to the APSI Podcast, the association of people supporting employment first, with your host, Chris Davies. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Minnesota APSI Podcast. This, in fact, is our first podcast of 2023, and we couldn't be more excited uh, to have uh, our guests here today, Don Lavin and Danielle Mahaney. We're going to learn all about them in, in just a moment. But, you know, I always like to to mention for anybody that maybe is is tuning in for the first time, and if you are, welcome. Uh, we're so glad you found us. Uh, maybe you don't know a lot about the organization of, of APSI and, and Minnesota APSI, so just want to let you know that, that APSI is a national organization, and it truly is the only membership organization solely focused on competitive integrated employment. And there are uh, several state chapters, not quite 52, but we're getting closer every day. And Minnesota has had a, you know, a chapter since the beginning. And we're really focused on uh, the idea of employment. And to us, employment means the same wages, same expectations, uh, you know, in the workplace as everyone else. And we believe that employment is, in fact, the, you know, the avenue out of poverty and isolation. So that's just a little bit about Minnesota APSI. And uh, again, we are so excited. Our first podcast of 2023. Congratulations to you both for being here. Uh, we have, I, I say this occasionally, but we truly have, uh, you know, Minnesota employment royalty here with us today. And, uh, you know, you're, uh, uh, Don certainly, and we're all dressed great. Don't, you know, I'm not knocking on any of us, but Don certainly is dressed like royalty over there. He looks like, uh, the royal king in his blue uh, suede jacket there. So, so glad to have these these two with us. And um, uh, Danielle uh, Mahaney is the is a education program specialist with the University of Minnesota Institute on Community Integration. And Don Lavin is a consultant. He has his own business, Strengths at Work. And they really focus on uh, competitive, integrated employment outcomes for uh, youth and adults, isn't that right? So, uh, and, uh, they both have done, uh, many, many things and have made, uh, a multitude of contributions to, uh, you know, the citizens of Minnesota in the arena of employment. And certainly strengths at work, Don, I would say is sort of, uh, just the tip of your iceberg. <laughs> a lot, uh, a lot underneath all that. So, we're excited to have you two here today. Before we, we move into a little bit about your backgrounds, I uh, want to give uh, visual descriptions uh, for all of our audience members. Uh, myself, I am a white male. I am bald. In fact, just shaved my head this morning, so I am, I am clean as a whistle. Uh, I have a red beard. And today I'm wearing uh, the, sort of this uh, Patagonia green vest that my son gave me for uh, Christmas. And... Uh, blue jeans. So Danielle, would you like to describe uh, yourself? Sure. This is Danielle. I am a white woman with shoulder length blonde hair. Today I'm wearing a blue sweater, yellow skirt, and some gray leggings. And Don. Thank you. I'm a white male, getting a little bit older, so there's some gray in that dark hair of mine. And I am wearing a blue blazer with a red vest, a sweater vest, with an Ed Hardy tie that is blue with a red flower right at, at the top. And probably that people won't be able to see this, but I also am wearing very colorful shoes, which will not be a surprise to people that know me. You know, for some, for some of our audience members that can, can, can hold them up. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Can you describe those shoes, Don? Well, my shoes are actually, uh, I made them. I, I actually designed them. They're blue, red, gold, with neon uh, shoelaces. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's a, that's a fun fact about Don that, that everyone else might not know. He's a shoe, would you say connoisseur, collector, maven? What do you call yourself? All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, I, it's been a while, but I'd love to come over and see your collection again. 
<laughs> All right. Thank you both. Well, let's move into to really getting to know uh, a little bit more about you. Um, tell us a little bit about your backgrounds. Uh, let's start with you, Don. Great. Thank you. And thank you for inviting us. Well, you know, Chris, uh, as unbelievable as it sounds in October of this year, I will have worked professionally in the employment and disability space for 50 years, five decades. Uh, you know, it, it's been an amazing ride. You know, I've worked in direct service. I've worked as a middle manager. I've worked in an executive position. And I've worked in a variety of advocacy capacities as well. Uh, and as you shared earlier, I am now self-employed as an independent consultant, uh, doing business as Strengths at Work, LLC. I, I'm presently working in partnership with the University of Minnesota and UMass and delivering consultative services to Minnesota service providers, in my case, primarily in greater Minnesota. I'm working with six organizations currently. I think you probably know this, but I am a former board member of both Minnesota and National APSI, a founding board member of the Employment First Coalition in our state. And I like to tell people I've been doing work in, internationally as well. Uh, some of my consultative work has brought me to India, Russia, um, Africa, New Zealand, and other locations. And the reason I'm bringing this up <clears throat> is that sometimes when we t start talking about the Employment First movement, we think this is something new in Minnesota. And actually, it's a worldwide phenomenon. People are curious about ways to change and transform the disability service system throughout the world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, employment is a core, important function to all human beings. And all human beings means all human beings. That's much further than Minnesota. So that's, that's great. Thank you, Don, for, for sharing, sharing all that with us. Uh, Danielle, tell us more about yourself. I have nowhere near Don's experience that I've been working in the area of disability employment for a little over a decade now. Um, I started um, after college working as a what was essentially a live-in direct support professional. I became interested in working with people with disabilities on a whim in college when I took a class on disability. Um, and so I lived for a couple of years, living assistant for people with disabilities um, and became much more interested in policy during that time. Um, so in graduate school, I did various internships focusing on disability, got interested in the employment side, um, and then worked in the advocacy world for a number of years with a focus on employment and um, day supports and transition to adulthood. Um, so I've been at the Institute on Community Integration for almost five years now, um, three years full time. And there I work on a number of projects, um, most of which revolve around supporting research and providing training and technical assistance in the area of employment and day supports. Um, so right now, most of my time is spent on the project we'll be talking about here today, the Minnesota Transformation Initiative. Um, but a few years ago, I worked on a similar, smaller, but similar project with Don as well called the Minnesota um, Technical Assistance Project. MinTap, where we started to do the kind of work that um, we really built off into the project we're doing today, working with providers across the state to transform their services away from center-based and some minimum wage work into competitive integrated employment. Um, thank you. Thank you, Danielle. And, and uh, like you, I have no near the amount of experience that, that Don has. I don't think too many of us uh, do. But the work you've done, I've known you for, for quite a while now, has been tremendously, tremendously Im impactful. So, uh, uh, definitely don't sell yourself short on, uh, the impact that you've, you've and had. And she's fun to work with. Yes. Yes. Right absolutely. Right back at you, Don. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I'm, I'm having fun right now. Okay. So let's, uh, you, you both kind of touched a little bit upon just sort of some of the evolution and the history, you know, of employment, uh, in Minnesota. And, you know, as you said, Don, worldwide, but, uh, I'd like to spend some time, uh, you know, particularly for our audience, because this is such an incredible opportunity to have literally, uh, you know, a living historian here, you know, with us today and, uh, that has, has been involved really, uh, through all the, the evolution of, of employment into where we are today. 
You know, as I like to say, it's a journey. We haven't arrived, but I would like to say that, think that we are definitely evolving, uh, and continue to do, uh, each and every day. But, you know, give our audience, Don, and, and of course, Danielle as well, um, some perspective on, on how we got here to, to where we are today. I could start. In January, we had an opportunity to celebrate Martin Luther King Day. And I went to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I went to a celebration of Martin Luther King at my grandson's school. And they were talking about a number of Martin Luther King quotes and things he said in his speeches. And one stood out and I think really, really summarizes my experience working these last five decades in Minnesota in this employment and disability space. Martin Luther King said, uh, Throughout the long arc of history, the history, the journey bends in the direction of justice. And you think about that, and I thought, wow, that's a, that sounds exactly what we've been through here in Minnesota. You know, it started off as seeds of thought. You know, we had some uh, advocates and, and people that were trying to rally around the, the idea of a better life for people with disabilities. And so we started out, you know, very modestly. Just a quick story, Chris. A couple of months ago, I was looking for something. And Danielle knows the story, so she's already laughing. Uh, I was looking for something that I, I thought would be helpful to some of the consulting work we're doing. And I came across a grant reapplication from the state of Minnesota's State Supported Employment Project. And the reason I had a copy of it is I was the chairperson of the, of the committee. It was a statewide committee. And this particular project was a five-year project that had the participation of state agencies and service providers from all regions of the state. So I open up this grant reapplication and I'm looking at the objectives, the vision and the objectives in the grant application. And they're talking about, you know, we need to cr- increase opportunities and choices for people to find and, and work in competitive integrated employment. We need the state agencies to work together, to develop better policies that drive better outcomes for employment. You know, they need to do a better job of restructuring funding. They need, we need better alternatives for transportation so that people can go into individualized employment. We gotta do a better job working with families and we have to work better with self-advocates around uh, disability benefits, planning so that they see that work is, you know, can still be a valuable part of their life. It goes on and on, working with employers, collecting better data. What does that sound like? It sounds like today, doesn't it? I was going to say, that sounds all too familiar. That that grant was older than I am, too, by the way. <laughs> it was three, I feel old. three and a half decades ago. Yeah. It, was, Thir- it was late 84, right? Is that correct. right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. And, and the grant, I think, went through. I was in high school. The late, the late eighties. And, and the reason I'm telling this story is that sometimes when we talk about the work we're doing, it's like we're thinking, oh, this is something new. Yeah. It's not new at all. Yeah. It's not new at all. This is a continuation of a vision that our state yeah. leaders had back in the eighties to, to, you know, to create a better life for Minnesotans who live with disabilities, including people with significant disabilities. So, you know, I share this story so that we, we understand this is a continuation of something that was started and written, articulated in writing, you know, three and a half decades ago. Sure. So, you know, so where, where are we today? And I don't think it's any secret that we have much, a much stronger public policy foundation than we had three and a half decades ago. You know, we have, uh, Title one of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We have Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. We have court ordered, uh, Minnesota's Olmstead plan. We have a Minnesota Employment First policy. You know, you got IDEA. I mean, I, you know, I can go on and on here. Now, the CMS is, uh, home and community based services settings rule that, you know, that's going to be active here shortly. So, if you look at it all, all the public policies, the court decisions, some of the emerging practices that are coming out of research, 
you know, these are all vectors pointing in the same direction, that people need to have a more person-centered, self-determined life, what I like to call a working life, where you, where you have work and you have other opportunities to live your life in an inclusive way in the community. And which makes it a life that works. Exactly. Yeah, Minnesota has a lot of work to do in this area. Um, the, the Minnesota Disability Law Center put out a report on some minimum wage, um, this past year. Um, and in it, they looked at the number of people working in 14C, some minimum wage jobs. Minnesota has the third highest number of people working in some minimum wage jobs, um, in the country. The only two states that are, are ahead of us are California and Pennsylvania, which have much higher populations. Uh, we also have a huge dependence on center-based employment um, over competitive integrated employment. And that comes from a historic a historic tendency for Minnesota to be really progressive with employment services. Um, back when institutions were closing, Minnesota was trying to find ways to get people in their communities out of institutions. And what that looked like was group homes and um, day service centers and sheltered workshops. Um, so at one point, it was those were created with the intent of getting people in the community. It was a progressive step, and then Minnesota stalled a little bit um, and got comfortable with that model when other states were moving ahead um, toward even more inclusive models. Um, so we have a lot of unbuilding, unraveling, and rebuilding to do in Minnesota. But I think, as Don pointed out, there's a lot of policies pointing in the right direction, and I think there's a lot of energy now to move those forward. The only last thing I wanted to add, and it's not brown nosing here, but I really do believe, having lived through all these years of working in this space, that we are seeing collaboration that I've never seen before from state agency leaders, from some of the the trade associations that are, you know, APSI and more partnering and working together to, you know, toward a common purpose of increasing employment. I mean, these these are things that were unheard of 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, truly uh, groundbreaking. Absolutely. Uh, types of, of phenomenons happening. And, and, and like you said, uh, you know, Don, uh, unprecedented uh, amount of um, different a- types of agencies, state, and, uh, you know, private nonprofits working together. Uh, I think about those early days of, of the, you know, like the very first employment first summit, you know, that we had back in, uh, 2006, right? Right. That's right. Does that sound right. So, 16 years ago. Yeah. And so a lot of the work, uh, that, that I'm doing, um, uh, along with, uh, our director of customized employment, you know, for the company I work for during the day, uh, we're work, we're starting to do a lot of well we we've done it before but we're particularly right now working with a lot of young people who are telling us that they never thought about not working you know and the whole idea of employment first employment being the first and preferred option yeah you know, that not something that you opt into but something you opt out of we're starting to actually see now those young people coming of age, you know, with that, with that expectation and just sort of that mindset. So, um, a lot of work to do, uh, is, is Dan, as you said, Danielle, but also I'm seeing some actual tangible results of, of all the work that, you know, the tireless work that people have been doing all these years. So, so it's exciting, but it's a, it's a journey. It's no different really to me than the civil rights movement. I mean, we're still saying the same things today that we were saying in the sixties. We're not there yet. Absolutely, Chris. That's a very valid point. And I like to tell people when they ask me about, the, you know, the subminimum wage issue that I know our state is grappling with. Can you imagine if we decided as, you know, as a community of people that we were going to pay any other minority group a subminimum wage? Can you, can you imagine what the backlash would be? I mean, this is an, a very archaic rule and it's, it's time to move forward. And I, I, I want to be clear that I understand there was always good intent behind what the, the work that was being done in the past, you know, and so we have to honor that, but we have to move forward. You know, life moves on, technology changes, you know, the culture changes and it's time for people with disabilities to be honored for the work they do making minimum wage or greater. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here, here. Uh, So 
again, uh, we talked about, uh, you know, there's still work to be done. So let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the work, uh, that, uh, you, you alluded to, uh, moments ago, Danielle, the Minnesota Transformation, uh, initiative. And, uh, you know, uh, the two of you, and maybe we'll start with you, Danielle, uh, kind of talk us through that. You know, what is going on, uh, with that initiative and, uh, some of the work that's been done and, and, uh, you know, and beyond. The Minnesota Transformation Initiative, or MTI, comes out of legislation that was passed in Minnesota in the spring of 2021, so almost two years ago. That legislation did two things. It established the task force on eliminating some minimum wage, which just recently published their recommendations for the legislature. Very exciting. I'm sure we'll come back to that a little bit. Um, but the other piece of that legislation was um, was developing the Provider Reinvention Grant Program. Um, that program has um, provided funds to provider agencies that are interested in ending their subminimum wage um, to help them with the different changes that they need to make in order to see that transformation through. Um, and it also established a technical assistance center um, to support those agencies in making that transformation hopefully a bit more effectively, um, providing them those supports to, to do those changes. So that's what MTI is, Minnesota Transformation Initiative. We are that technical assistance center um, that is primarily housed at the University of Minnesota's Institute on Community Integration, but we're working with a number of partners, um, including the University of Massachusetts Boston Institute for Community Inclusion, the other ICI, as we call it. Um, Strengths at Work, Don here is a partner, as is the ARC Minnesota um, and Quillow. Um, and as part of that project, we it, it's it's a very large project and we have a number of initiatives and activities going on for it. Um, the primary of which is supporting these provider agencies that are receiving grants as part of this program to develop business plans um, and think through what it means to really transform their services away from some minimum wage toward community-based competitive integrated employment services. So each of those agencies, um, and there's, there's eight of agencies that have committed to ending some minimum wage as part of this program, um, two he- based here in the Twin Cities Metro, and six of which are um, in greater Minnesota. Um, they're all working with a technical assistance team from our project, um, and that's a, that's a really big part of what we're doing is supporting them. Um, we also are overseeing another grant program um, that's focused on expanding capacity for competitive integrated employment across the state, which is so important because ideally, hopefully, um, as we end some minimum wage, that doesn't get anyone a job. So we need greater capacity um, to support people to look for jobs, um, more staff that are trained in that, better training opportunities, all of that. Um, and a couple other pieces of the project as well. The ARC is creating some peer-to-peer mentorship programs, one um, geared toward self-advocates. So they have um, a handful of self-advocate peer mentors who will be working with um, individuals who currently work in some minimum wage jobs at these providers that um, we're supporting through this grant program um, to, to talk with them through what the tra- change might be for them, um, to think about, um, think, you know, what might it mean to work? Um, what are some of the, the concerns they have and really walk with them in that, um, the ARC will also be um, developing a, a family peer-to-peer mentorship program. So very similar, but family members talking with family members. Um, one of the biggest challenges for people considering employment in some situations is um, fears and concerns and resistance from family members. Um, so trying to provide them with information and support as well as they look for that change that's coming. Um, so that's a broad overview. There, there are more pieces to the project than that, but, um, it's, it's a great collaboration of a lot of partners and the, including the state agency partners. Um, DHS has been a really just very supportive and really putting the resources and attention and energy into the project that it needs and deserves to really try to move the needle on things. Um, so that's a broad overview. Don, is there anything you want to add? Well, just to baby to add that the, the organizations that have applied for these grants are doing so voluntarily. 
So they're not being coerced to do something that they don't want to do. They're making uh, decisions locally that they want to transform their organizations and, uh, you know, move in the direction that, you know, is progressive and provides the best outcomes possible for people. And maybe the other piece is that we are working with these organizations individually. You know, so these transformation plans that are being developed, we're calling them transformational business plans, but they're being customized by agency by agency. This is not, you know, a cookie cutter kind of approach where everybody has the same plan. Everybody's plan is going to be different because you have ec- economic issues that are different, cultural issues that are different in different regions of the state. Uh, I'm working with agencies in greater Minnesota, and Danielle is focused, I think, a little heavier with uh, at least some metro. Mm-hmm. There's very different issues that are that those organizations are grappling with, you know. So, yeah, so, you know, we're trying to make sure th- that these are not plans of MTI. These are the plans of these organizations, and where they're there to help them build their plans, build their capacities, and implement them with resources training, technical assistance, and information that will help them roll it out. Yeah, and in each of the providers um, have a team of two, one person from Minnesota and then one person from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Um, and that's been a really great team, I think, for each of these agencies because they have someone who knows and understands the Minnesota context very well. And then our partners from UMass Boston bring the national perspective. Um, the, the other ICI, Institute for Community Inclusions, has been doing this work in provider transformation for decades across the country. So they have really deep experience um, in provider transformation work and and focused on competitive integrated employment. Um, so it, it it the two people on each of these teams bring really deep but also like broad understanding of what's needed to make this change happen here in Minnesota for each of these providers. Um, so it's been cool to see. Yeah, it sounds like a really unique perspective uh, that those organizations, you know, would get. So, yeah, I really like what you said about these. It's a volunteer or, or the organizations you're working with have volunteered. So it sounds like you know the the companies uh, organizations involved in this uh, pro or initiative you know have made that decision have have sort of seen the the landscape around them and know that uh the demand is growing that people want to work in their own jobs and they made a decision we want to to help people be a part of that and uh, you know it sounds like from the same token you're helping the families and the uh, individuals as well uh, as as they navigate through that. Absolutely. The other thing that's important to point out is while we're working with these organizations in a customized way individually, they're also working together. Mm-hmm. So we do have monthly community of practice calls, okay, which are exchanges. You know, people are sharing information about. You know, usually, they're topical, and people will get. For example, we had a. A community of practice on, um, on transportation. And as you might guess, the people in greater Minnesota had completely different issues than some of the folks in the metro area, but they all had issues. Yeah. So they all had something to share with each other. Sure. So these community of practice sessions have been a helpful way to get Minnesota agencies talking with each other. Find trying to find some common ground of, mm-hmm. you know, of, you know, how to do something better. What's worked for us might work for you, mm-hmm. you know, whether something could be adapted or adopted. And we're also doing quarterly training. Maybe Danielle can touch on some of the quarterly training that we're doing, which is also content specific. Yeah, that's right. So Mm -hmm. while a lot of the work we're doing is focused on the providers who are part of the grant program, we are also developing trainings and resources and tools that will be available to any provider Mm -hmm. um, in the state that's interested in transformation. This project is is has a pretty tight timeline in part just because of the funding sources and when those need to be spent by. So this project will end in spring of 2024 Mm -hmm. next year, Mm -hmm. um, unless there's any extension of the funding. Um, So recognizing that there are provider agencies that will want to, um, that will want to 
transform their services beyond that timeline, we're trying to develop tools that they'll be able to use, even if the technical assistance won't be available. And we know from this round of grants, too, that there were a number of agencies that were interested in applying for the grant, but they just didn't feel like they were quite ready mm-hmm. or they were going, they, the capacity has been a huge issue too. I mean, so many providers are experiencing huge workforce shortages and um, many were concerned about taking on this, this extra added activity um, and grant right now. So we are doing re- um, quarterly trainings that are open to any provider mm-hmm. um, in the state and focus on different transformation topics. Um, our first one um, was about setting the vision and defining success. Like where do you even get started? Right. Um, and that's some of the agencies we're working with too. We, we, we're seeing a huge range of where they're at in the process. Some have been thinking about this for years and are already rolling with their plans. They've mm-hmm. already begun um, hiring staff and making some of those um, adjustments within their facilities and their services to make this happen. And then there are some that they're like, Ooh, we, we recognize we need to do, to do this. And we have absolutely no idea what what it looks like or how to do it. And so they're really in that visioning stage um, of trying to figure out like, what do we want our services to look like um, going forward? So we had a training that was focused on that. We have one um, upcoming in a couple of weeks, I believe, um, that'll be focused on managing through change. So how do you manage your staff in the midst of this organizational transformation? Um, and one of the the great parts about these quarterly trainings is that we're partnering with more um, the Minnesota Organization for Habilitation and Rehabilitation to identify the topics for mm-hmm. the training. So what what are their member organizations most interested? interested in learning about what are they hearing as priorities for them. Um, and more is also helping us to identify trainers. Um, so it's not just the MTI team, Don, myself, and our colleagues that are leading these trainings, but it's um, people from providers here in Minnesota um, who have experience in these topics mm-hmm. that can share their own stories and the knowledge and wisdom um, that they've gained. So that's a really big piece of the project. And we're trying to put together all of this, these trainings and these tools and resources we're developing into some sort of a a toolkit or package that will be available and live beyond the project for those who want to pick it up and take on that transformation work. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like that really gives it a lot of sustenance, you know, uh, having it uh, packaged that way. Um, and I, I hope that they are able to extend the funding because, uh, I think we all know that, uh, there's going to be more organizations that maybe weren't quite ready that are going to want to, uh, to go about that. But it sounds like, um, in case that doesn't happen, you're, you're developing some, you know, some things that can be sustainable or help organizations be sustainable. You, you've mentioned some, but what are some of the other, like, just key things you've learned in this first year with the initiative? Let me, let me go first because I want to lay this one out here and then I'll let Danielle. One of the things that I think has bubbled up in this last year is there's a difference between change and transformation. And let me explain. We know that organizations can stop paying the a subminimum wage and not do anything different except start, you know, giving people payroll checks that are minimum wage or greater. But is that transformation? Uh, I think not. And part of the values of the Minnesota Transformation Initiative is to support agencies to deliver the kind of transformation in their organization that will transform the lives of the people they support day to day. So what am I talking about? And I, I'm talking about more person-centered planning, more person-centered types of employment outcomes, uh, more meaningful community life engagement types of activities. So in other words, greater inclusion, greater integration, more choices, more opportunities for people to truly belong. You know, not, you know, sometimes the word integration is used and, you know, this is not just somebody who's standing among others. They're actually, they belong and they're actually part of the community. They're actually part of the workforce. So we are trying to support these organizations to understand that transformation means changing who you are. Mm-hmm. And may mean changing your mission, changing your purpose, changing the values, mm-hmm. starting to look at your service delivery system, looking at the skill sets that your staff have. You know, do they have 
you know, the, the knowledge and the skills to implement the kind of employment services that are best practices. Do you have middle managers that actually understand what employment first means? And do they understand what competitive integrated employment means? There's not a lot of under, a lot of definitions of employment. Sure. And so, you know, these are the kinds of things that we are grappling with. So I want to really underscore transformation is really important. And we're learning that not everybody understands that. Yes, I cannot agree more <laughs> with what you just said, Don. I know we've had a lot of conversations about that. I, it's been really interesting seeing the different providers in different places, both in terms of their, of where they're at with the transformation, but also geography and size. And we're working with a really wide range of providers from very, very, very large providers, um, based here in the Twin Cities metro to very, very, very small providers, um, in rural parts of Minnesota. Um, and something that's struck me, I, I feel particularly for those small, more rural providers that they haven't always, they haven't had much of an opportunity to see what competitive integrated employment can even look like. And here in the Twin Cities Metro, even if, if there's a provider that isn't doing much in the way of competitive integrated employment supports, it's easy to look around and see it. You can see other providers serving people in your community who are doing those services. Um, and it's not, it's pretty accessible for people. Um, there's also just a lot of resources based here to support those providers. There's, there's more transportation resources um, for people to get to work. Um, there's there's just, it's a very different feel when you are in a very small town in rural Minnesota that has one provider um, that supports people in that town or in that area. And that provider historically may have never provided supports for competitive integrated employment. And we're working with some of those agencies right now where they have pre-vocational services, they have Mm center-based employment, maybe they have some groups that go out um, and do cleaning at some community businesses. And and that's all they, they do right now. And that's all they've historically done. And it's so difficult to for them to sometimes wrap their head around, like, how can we do this here? Um, and so that's a really another thing that I'm loving about pulling together these different providers as part of this project to mm-hmm. share with each other and to share, like, this is what it can look like and this is how we can do it. We have some really wonderful providers who are doing it, who have been doing the work and are really committed to it philosophically and are sh- having great results. Um, shout out to UDAC in Duluth. Yeah. They're one of those who committed during the pandemic to ending their center-based employment and day supports and moving to 100% community-based. Mm-hmm. And they are doing amazing things up there. Um, so we're really grateful to have some great examples of what it looks like. And that I, like, there's just so many of those small providers who need to see what it can be. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things I am most mm-hmm. excited about with this. Just another observation. We, um, we're learning that a lot of people look at employment in traditional ways, fitting person to job. Instead of fitting job to person, you know, I'm, I'm moving in the direction of understanding what discovery and customizing employment can look like sure. for individuals, particularly those that have complex and significant disabilities. A lot of people, you know, they think they know what it means, but when you talk to them, they really don't. Mm-hmm. They really don't understand the discovery process, you know, the drilling down to look for the gifts and the unique talents and contributions that, that people can make. And so, you know, this is a big part of our education is, you know, that we need an awakening that, you Mm -hmm. know, there's another way of thinking about how employment can work and and kind of a partner to that. A lot of people think when we're talking about employment, we're talking about 30, 40 hour a week jobs. You know, it's employment first doesn't mean employment only. And and we're trying to get people to understand that there can be another part of their day, part of their week where they're working a, a job, but also maybe doing other things they enjoy in the in the community and doing it in an inclusive, integrated way. Yeah. And that's decided one person at a time. One yeah. person at yeah, a time. Absolutely. Because everybody, that's why it's customized, because there is no just one discovery process for the same, all the people. You know, everybody's journey is going to unfold in a different way. 
another lesson learned that will surprise no employment service provider in Minnesota is the lack of accessible and affordable training, particularly for customized employment. Um, that's been continued to come up as a roadblock for some of the agencies we're supporting. You know, when, when I'm, when I talked about the agencies that are really struggling to envision what this can look like and how to make it happen in their areas, we talk about customized employment and they'll be like, okay, yeah, like mm-hmm. we'll give that a try. And then trying to find, um, training for that, that is, that is no. going to be coming up soon mm-hmm. and moves or moves along in a timely manner and doesn't cost a lot, a lot of money, especially when agencies are seeing so much turnover, um, it has been a big challenge. So we have been, um, as part of MTI talking with state agencies and trying to come up with plans to expand that capacity. That's one of the goals of this project is how can mm-hmm. we expand capacity for competitive integrated employment? And a big Mm -hmm. piece of that is going to have to be having more training for customized employment available for employment specialists. Yeah. Yeah. And coupled with, that's huge. Coupled with what Danielle is saying, the other thing we've, we're discovering is that there are a lot of middle managers Mm. with virtually no employment experience, uh, supervising or providing employment as part of their career and professional history. Mm. You know, maybe they worked in disability services and legacy programs, delivering day program services, and now they're finding themselves being asked to lead transformational Mm. change in the direction of competitive integrated employment. Well, you know, they're not much of an asset to their direct reports if they don't have a good foundation in things like discovery and mm-hmm. customized employment. So yeah. we're, we're looking at, you know, and maybe I'm moving ahead a little bit as far as the future goes, but we're, we're looking at ways that uh, we can develop a curriculum and start looking at training mm-hmm. for middle managers because they're working in the middle of the, you know, the executives and the direct reports and, and they're the ones, the, the weight mm-hmm. of transformation often rests right. on their shoulders day to day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just, to, uh, I, I think a lot in, uh, metaphors and, uh, it's, it's sort of the oxygen mask that they have to figure out how to put on first so they can help somebody else put theirs on. And, uh, there's a lot that goes into that oxygen mask when we're talking about, uh, comp- uh, customized employment. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, you can't give somebody something you don't have. So you have to have it first. And I don't want to leave this out because I think it's really important. Leadership matters. Mm. You know, if you don't, if, if you have leaders in organizations that are doing something because they have to, mm-hmm. that's a whole different animal than Working with yeah. leaders who are doing this because it's the right thing to do, mm-hmm. and and they want to improve outcomes for the people they support, you know. So, you know, and we're really fortunate. We're working with really some dynamic, sure, outstanding people that, you know, maybe they're in different points in the journey, but they want to do this. They want to learn, you know, how to manage their organizations in better ways. They want to learn more about the research, you know, just. Yesterday, I, I mailed out recent research from the Journal of Voc Rehab about the efficacy of competitive integrated employment models versus uh, segregated mm-hmm. employment and day program services. You know, hands down, yeah. the CIE, competitive integrated employment models, you know, outpace them on every measure, not sure. just getting jobs, but wages, hours worked, benefits, uh, even even health. Yeah, quality of life. Quality yeah. of life indicators. So, sure. you know, I, I think people want to do the right thing. It's the, they just need mm-hmm. somebody to, you know, open the door and provide a little bit of guidance. Yeah. yeah, I really believe, like you're saying, that buy-in has to start with the person or the persons in the vision setting part of the business. Uh, it's got to start there and, and you got a good chance if it, if it starts with, with that person. Because it can go all the way through the organization, but if it's just the the you know whatever middle middle people that believe in it, it's gonna it's gonna get stuck. Yeah, I do think that leadership being philosophically on board is probably mm-hmm. the number one most important yeah. um, element to that. really make it move forward. What are you excited about for year two? Wow. 
That's a big question. Go ahead, Daniel. You go first. Said very, <laughs> said very succinctly. <laughs> we, so we just continue to keep adding things to this project. Mm-hmm. One of the great things about this grant, like, you know, I said that DHS has been a, a wonderful funding partner and they are providing us a lot of flexibility to respond to needs that we see coming up as we do this work, like the, the customized employment training, for example, um, trying to find ways to build that capacity. And we've added a number of new activities that we're going to be taking on for at least the next few months. Um, we're going to be adding in a component focused on lead agencies, so counties, um, working with them to provide them with technical assistance to how they can improve employment outcomes within their counties, um, and also developing a kind of like a community of practice, um, conversations mm-hmm. amongst supervisors of case managers and case managers about mm-hmm. employment and some of the barriers that they, they come up against, um, in supporting people to, um, pursue competitive integrated employment. We're also going to be adding some work focused on, um, community life engagement. And mm-hmm. that's a term that I don't think is super common and not really well known what that, what we mean by that. Um, community life engagement is the outcome of high quality community based day supports. Mm. So, um, day supports were ideally that are based entirely in the community rather than at a provider owned site and aren't just outings. Right. I say that in quotes where people are, are going somewhere and just trying to have fun, but are really meaningful and intentional and focused on skill building and on connecting people within their communities. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, um, with that in Minnesota. And we also know that a lot of provider agencies are really, really interested in that, yeah. um, in the state that's come up in surveys. And, um, we know that that's something that DHS has been hearing from providers about. And so we're looking forward to hopefully providing um, agencies across Minnesota with some more tools and resources and models about what that can look like. Um, we'll be offering some technical assistance and training around that as well. Um, we're also working on a, a handful of trainings that we'll be developing a mid-level manager training like Don referred to, um, trying to develop clear training pathways for employment specialists. Um, a lot of providers, especially the ones that are new to employment services, look at the competencies that the state requires for someone to deliver employment services and are really unsure how to train someone to get in that into mm-hmm. that position to do so. So trying to develop just much clearer ideas for provider agencies about what, what training should people be doing um, to get them to that level. So we've got a lot, a lot of other stuff coming up here that we'll be working on. Am I missing anything, Don? Yes, you are. And you're, this one you're going to get nervous about. Oh, boy. <laughs> but it's, I'm excited about it. Uh, we're we're, uh, we're going to be launching business leadership forums around the state. So we know we can't leave our business community out of the conversation here. And, you know, and, and let me clarify, you know, of course, we're not talking about any job. You know, we know if it's a person-centered job, it's got to be a job that fits, right? <clears throat> but that being said, is there a better time for us to be talking to business leaders about employment of people with mm-hmm. disabilities, this large, untapped talent pool? Uh, I don't think it's any secret for anybody that reads the newspaper or uh, pays attention online that, you know, we've had historic unemployment here in the state. We've had workforce shortages. Employers are looking for answers. And uh, while people with disabilities may not be a complete answer, they certainly can be a partial answer. And I think it opens up at least a window of opportunity to talk with employers about customized employment, about how building jobs around the talents and skills of people not only makes sense for them, but these folks can be economic assets in their company and their we want to get businesses that have the experience doing this talking to others. Mm-hmm. So this is not going to be, you know, uh, Danielle and I going out and telling everybody why this is a good idea. We want businesses with positive experiences talking to others, saying it worked for us and, and, and we think it can work for you. And some of the... Uh, you know, some of the, the, the old myths about, you know, people with disabilities won't fit in or, you know, whatever. There's all kinds of myths about them not holding up. 
And it's simply not true. Of course, you know that, Chris. Mm, of course. Uh, we just need to get the correct information out to employers about why considering this labor pool makes a lot of sense. And we're hoping to do it regionally with partnerships around the state so that the people, you know, who have uh, connections with businesses in that community, you know, can help us uh, set it up, plan it, and maybe even have businesses take a lead role in inviting other businesses to come to a forum and talk about it. As you can probably tell, we yes. are trying hard to touch all of the different stakeholders involved mm-hmm. in this topic. We're working yes. with providers. We're um, providing supports for individuals in some minimum wage employment and for families. We're working with counties. We're going to be working with employers. Um, just all of these different parties who are involved. And we're, we're trying to be very intentional and thoughtful about how to tie all of this work together. So we don't just have one initiative going on over here, one initiative going on over here, but you know, how can we tie these together either within regions or across the state so that it all makes sense and that it's all working together to move the needle um, on reducing some minimum wage and increasing competitive integrated employment. Yeah. That's been very clear, you know, to me as I listen to both of you talk, uh, the collaborative efforts, you know, out there. I, I was in a training yesterday and uh, I heard somebody say that all of us are smarter than one of us. And I, I really get that, you know, in the, the processes that you're talking about. To your point, Chris, you know, I believe, you know, another lesson learned is that problems need to be resolved locally, regionally. You know, we can sit up here in the Capitol and say, right. oh, everybody should do this. But you have different players. Mm-hmm. You know, you have, you know, whether it's schools, you know, that are looking at transition of youth into adulthood. You got residential providers. You know, they need to move. You know, the needle needs to move with them as well, you know, to accommodate different work schedules of, of people that are not going to be driven into the facility and driven back at the exact same time. You got voc rehab offices. You have, uh, you know, the lead agencies, county case managers advocacy organizations. I mean, everybody needs to come together to figure out how can we make, how can we do this differently so we can uh, advance the best life possible for people all around the state. A working life. A working life. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, it, you know, I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, somebody might be watching us here today, um, uh, who maybe has a, a key, you know, role in their organization and is thinking to themselves that they'd like to get more involved in, you know, these types of things. Uh, I know that, that, you know, you're working specifically with, with eight organizations that applied for the grant and so on and so forth. But if somebody wanted to get more involved, uh, that isn't maybe part of that pool, uh, you know, how, what would you, what would you say to them? To get started, watch for upcoming opportunities. Um, you're right. The, those grant opportunities are not open right now. We don't know if there'll be other opportunities for something like that. Hopefully there will be, but we don't know at this point. Um, but we do have those statewide trainings, for example, like if you just want to get in the same space of people who are thinking about this and considering mm-hmm. this, um, join one of these trainings. They're free register um, online and hear what's going on in the state, hear what other people are up to. Um, all, all those trainings you're hearing from other providers in the state who are doing the same sort of work. Um, we're also going to be at the Moore Spring Conference in May. Okay. Um, so if you are at an agency that's a member of Moore, mm-hmm. um, come see us then. We'll be leading a few sessions on this sort of work. Um, some that'll be directed at mid-level managers, um, a couple that'll be directed at senior leadership, um, and watch for resources that'll be coming out as well. Um, we'll be making sure to share those through DHS channels as well as others. Um, but we'll, we're going to be doing our best to create opportunities for sure. people to access these tools and resources. So that's my like official MTI response. Mm-hmm. But Don, I, I suspect you might have more general. And, and before Don, before you go down, where would one go to register for these trainings? Yes, yeah, so you can go to our website, um, which I don't know that I can pull that off the top of my head. I think it might be MTI dot ICI mm-hmm. dot edu and if it's not you can edit that right yeah. out of here. And most of us Google these yeah, days Google. anyway. So if you Googled Minnesota, Minnesota Transformation, Transformation Initiative. Initiative. Okay. Yeah. 
Perfect. You'll be able to find it. Perfect. And this is not a paid advertisement, Minnesota APSI. I mean, join Minnesota APSI, get involved. I've heard of them. You've heard of them. And, you know, and to those of you that might be listening in greater Minnesota, we need more people living in greater Minnesota to get involved. You know, this is not a metro driven organization. You know, we, we want to be a statewide organization that represents everyone. And I think it's a great place to learn. It's a great place to get energized by like minded people. Yeah. That's a, a really good point. And I, I think most of, our audience knows that I am on the board of Minnesota APSI and as is Danielle. And uh, in fact, she's one of the co-presidents. Uh, but we just had two new, correct me if I'm wrong, two new board members join us from greater Minnesota, uh, which is very exciting. I also want to make my pitch for Minnesota APSI here. I've been on a couple of calls with provider agencies as part of MTI recently who are adding new lines of service. They're adding voc rehab or they're adding some of these, um, some of the waiver employment services that they haven't done. And they're just really unsure how to do it. And like how, what does this look like from an organizational perspective? What, what do they need to do to make this work and happen? And they just have all of these questions about some of the, the minutia of introducing these new services and how to deliver them within their organizations. Um, and they were asking like, are there, who can we ask about this? Like, what are the resources out there other than us, other than MTI, which is not going to be around forever. Um, and, well, Minnesota APSI is a great way to get involved because that's where you're going to find the people who know this really well and do this right. really well. Right. Um, so it's a really great, um, network of people to be connected to. I have not once in my time as part of Minnesota APSI um, not been able to find an answer to a question I had about this mm-hmm. stuff. I just send it out to the um, yeah. APSI crew and like mm-hmm. someone always knows. So. Somebody knows somebody. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> just thought I'd touch on one last thing that we have not mentioned at all, but it, even though we are doing a lot of customized type of work with organizations, we are really working from a framework of the 10 essential elements mm-hmm. for, of transformational change. These are researched elements that uh, the University of Massachusetts has been involved in, and it, it drives a lot of the work we do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it, it's obvious things like, you know, having the right vision and mission and, you know, you know that you, you have holistic services and the leadership, you know, that is articulating and communicating the, the kinds of things that need to be communicated so, so that, uh, people with disabilities, their families and other stakeholders are getting accurate information. You know, so these 10 elements, we, we have them online at the, I believe they're at, on the, um, the MTI website, right? And you can learn more about what are these 10 elements and, you know, and how do they make organizations different entities than than what they were. They sound like they'd be universal too for for many facets of life. Yeah, I, you know, I think so. Yeah. I think so, Chris, because yeah. uh you know, even though as we said earlier, we're not a cookie cutter right kind of approach, uh but but that being said, your vision and and your communication needs to make sense. Sure. They need to be in harmony. They need to yeah. to align. Yeah, and on, at those resources that Don mentioned that mm-hmm. are linked on the MTI website, um, UMass has created a toolkit based around these 10 elements. Mm-hmm. And on there, there's this self-assessment tool that providers can use um, to, to really get an idea of where they're at with mm-hmm. each of those 10 elements. And if, if you're with a provider that's thinking about this sort of work and isn't really sure how to get started, that can be a really good place mm-hmm. to get a sense of like, okay, where do we need to focus our attention at least right off the bat? Okay. We're already kind of doing this and this. We got some good momentum in these areas. We haven't even considered this area. Mm-hmm. So this might be a good place to start building up a strategy and some, sure. um, somewhat. So that's a, another good tool just for getting started. Mm-hmm. That's great. I mean, that sounds like a good thing for any organization. I'm, I'm thinking about the one I work, exactly. work for, you know, yeah. going on there. And I think you guys will come self. out pretty good there. Well, we probably would. We probably would. But, uh, you know, you, uh, as, as I always like to say, you know, you've never arrived. Uh, you got to stay humble. You got to stay hungry. There's always, yeah, always things you can do better. You know, so, uh, well, you know, we're getting close to wrapping up. Uh, you know, thank you both again for stomping on into Studio A here and joining us on this podcast. Uh, it's, it's truly been delightful. Uh, 
do you have any final or just anything maybe you want to share as long as it's not about the Yankees, uh, you know, with our, our audience out there, you know, before we go. Sure. I, it really feels like this is the time. And I know mm-hmm. that Don has said that and Don has a better sense than I do, a better pulse on like, you know, historically where this lines yeah. up, but it really feels like we've got a lot of positive energy and great collaborations and strong momentum. Um, and now there's talk at the legislature um, right now about ending some minimum wage in Minnesota mm-hmm. and putting the resources that are needed behind making that change positive. There have been other states that have ended some minimum wage. And not all of those states have had a really well thought out and Mm -hmm. intentional strategy behind that. Um, One of the criticisms you'll hear about ending some minimum wage or ending center-based work is that everyone ends up without services in their parents' basement. Um, And so it's just so vital that as we move in this direction of ending 14C, um, some minimum wage employment, what can we do to also build up employment? Um, what can we do to make sure that providers have the resources they need to make this transformation, that individuals and families have the information they mm-hmm. need, um, especially around benefits and other concerns they have um, in order to make that transition for themselves without that fear and that concern and that anxiety. Um, and I feel like Minnesota's heading in that direction yeah. and yeah. there's a lot of good synergy going along people are working well together collaborating well together um and i i am feeling very hopeful so i think that's how yeah. my final thought yeah that's that's beautifully said and yeah i don't know that i can say it better Pe- you know people say to me why why haven't you retired you know, you've been at this for 50 years isn't isn't it time you're getting to, younger you're well, like benjamin button but, you know, the truth is, you know, for years I was pushing that rock up the hill. Yes. And it was a heavy lift. Yes. You know, people walking out of presentations saying this guy's out of his mind, you know, and uh, we're, we're at a different we're in a different mm-hmm. place. Yeah. And I am seeing the rock going down the other side mm-hmm. of the hill for me. And it sounds trite, but it's finishing the job. Yeah. It's finishing yeah. the job that we started mm-hmm. and Yes, I'll leave, but I, I want to make sure that Minnesota has the capacities mm. to finish the job. And, I, and if I can be helpful, you know, working with people like Danielle has been wonderful. She's a young leader that's, you know, moving along. And I have all the faith in the world of, you know, the people at Minnesota APSI, the MTI, you know, to carry this thing forward. Yeah. You know, and my last point is, you know, we've been talking again about organizational transformation, but Competitive integrated employment is transforming. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've met individuals whose lives have been transformed because they had a job, a competitive job, and, and they were integrated out in the workforce. It's a gift mm-hmm. when you know that. Yeah. And when you know that, it's hard to walk away from it. Yeah. So let's finish the job. Yeah, that's so true. I mean... Before I even got into this field of employment, I saw it in my own life. You know, I was out of work for a significant amount of time. And when I started working again, it it added tremendous value to my life. And, you know, it's one of the reasons I've stayed so passionate about this movement, you know, you know, for all these years. So uh, really beautifully said, both of you and, and Danielle, when you were talking, I was thinking about something I often say is that the train has left the station, you know, and when I hear you talk, it's about making sure that everybody has a place on that train, you know, so, uh, yeah. Uh, well, everybody, this is uh, Danielle Mahaney and Don Lavin, uh, two, uh, two of the most intelligent, uh, passionate, and uh, nicest people I know. Uh, it's a, it's a privilege to, to continue our work together and, uh, uh, I, I couldn't have been more happy to, to to get to be the host of this wonderful podcast with you. So thanks again for coming in. And, uh, oh, go ahead. I was going to say thank you so much for having us, Chris. It was really wonderful to sit down and chat with you today. Well, I appreciate that. But uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that this doesn't happen without our producers, you know, Dana Eisfeld and, uh, and Connor, 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 Mr. C. <clears throat> uh, 
but uh, it doesn't happen without uh, without those folks behind the scenes as well. So uh, thanks so much, Don. Were you about to say something? Just thank you for inviting us. Absolutely. Onward. Absolutely. Onward and upward, as they say. And and uh, thank you, you know, to all of our fans out there listening. You know, if you're a fan of the, the Minnesota Absey podcast, please share it with your networks. Tell your friends uh, if this is your first time uh, listening to a, a podcast. Thank you so much for for uh, stopping on in and finding us and i just want to remind everybody out there that if you can if you believe it you can achieve it